I was 22 years old, and this was my first job out of graduate school. I was a newspaper reporter in Boston, and I loved it. You got to talk to the most interesting people, go to the most interesting events, keep learning. One day, I got called into the HR office, and I thought they were going to be changing our dental plan, <laughs> but it didn't turn out that way. That afternoon, I left the office without a job. It was a Monday afternoon, and I had been laid off. I went home that night, and I was scared. I didn't know how I was going to support myself, but I thought, all right, I'm going to wake up the next morning, and I'll figure it out. I'll go look for another job. And the only problem was it didn't quite turn out that way. The next morning, I woke up. I turned on the television. It turned out that the day that I had been laid off was Monday, September 10th, 2001. The next morning, the world changed. Planes stopped flying. The stock market stopped trading. The least of anyone's problems that day was an out-of-work newspaper reporter. They'd given me one week's severance pay. Technically, I had worked Monday, so it was actually four days severance pay. And I had to figure something out. And I did. But that moment made me vow that I was never going to let myself become that vulnerable, in such a, a precarious position again. And I haven't. These days, I earn money in a variety of different ways. I write books, I'm a professor, I speak, I consult. But what I've come to learn is it's not just me. These days, 35% of the American workforce, that's 55 million people, work as freelancers or contractors. And it's not just Americans. A study last year by the McKinsey Global Institute showed that 20 to 30 percent of working age adults in the European Union also are independent workers. This is a trend that's growing. We have to find ways to adapt. And so it really begs the question, what do we need to do? How can we prepare ourselves to future-proof our careers? I've researched that a lot over the past 10 years, and here's what I've learned. This is a gentleman named Lenny Achan. Lenny actually started his career as a nurse. And when I started consulting for the large hospital system where he worked, Everyone was talking about Lenny. And the reason they were was that by the time I had started consulting there, Lenny had a new job. He was the hospital's communications director, which is not at all the normal career path for a nurse. So when I met him, finally, I asked him, Lenny, how did, how did you get here? How did you end up doing this? And he told me that he had become fascinated over time with technology, with innovation. It was just a passion of his. And so on his own time, with his own money, he decided that he would develop a couple of apps. And he did. Eventually, of course, his boss found out about it. And his boss called him into the office. Lenny was terrified. He thought, oh no, did I violate some kind of a, a policy that I didn't know about? Does he think that I've been moonlighting on company time? And so he went in to the boss's office, and the boss said, Lenny, I hear that you've developed some apps. And Lenny said, um, yes, it's true, I have. And the boss said, we need someone to run social media for the hospital. I think you should do it. Lenny did such a good job, he ultimately got promoted to head up all of communications for the hospital. When you take the initiative, when you take your free time, when you are willing to invest in yourself and in your continued learning, you can push your career into places you never would have even thought possible. 
Now, of course, when we tell stories about entrepreneurship or, or thinking more entrepreneurially, the truth is they're not always happy stories, right? Not everything works. Failure is a part of being entrepreneurial. This is Bozy Dar. He was born in Serbia, lives now in the United States. By day, he is a very successful life sciences executive. But he also got interested in the world of apps. He thought it was cool, he wanted to learn about it. And so he also spent his own time and money developing an app. But in his case, he spent thousands of dollars developing an app, and it turned out no one wanted it. It was a total failure. And it is sad when that happens. But the truth is, it actually wasn't really a failure. Because in the process, Bozy learned something from it. He realized that he had made a mistake that a lot of people just starting out do. He had a cool idea, at least he thought it was a cool idea, and he hoped that other people would feel the same. But he realized he needed to, to maybe take a step back. He needed, instead of starting with a wish and a hope, he needed to start by looking at what was already working, what was, where the momentum already was in his life. And something that was working really well was his day job. He was getting promoted all the time. In fact, so much that his colleagues would come to him often and ask, can I have coffee with you? Can I pick your brain? I want to know what your secrets are to getting promoted. And he thought, maybe that's it. So he tried again, and he created another entrepreneurial side venture. This time, it was an online course about how to get promoted faster. And this time, because he started where the momentum was, because he had learned from his mistake, this one was a hit. Its first year alone, the course brought in more than $25,000. Today, Bozy calls himself an intrapreneur. He brings the knowledge and the learnings that he's gotten from his outside side ventures back into his company. And that makes him even more successful and even more valuable. When you apply what you've learned, you're able to future-proof yourself. You're able to make yourself indispensable. This is Joanne Chang. Now, when Joanne graduated from college, she took a job for a couple of years in management consulting. But pretty soon, she realized it wasn't for her. But when she thought back to what she really was passionate about, the thing that really had lit her up, she realized that what had been most fun for her was those days back in college when she used to bake in her dorm room. They used to call her the chocolate chip cookie girl because she would bake cookies and sell them around the dorm for 25 cents a piece. She didn't have any formal training in cooking, but she thought, this is something that I love. This is something I want to explore. Now, what most people would probably do in that situation is they would look around, they'd look at the help wanted ads, they'd search online and they'd see what was out there and they'd send in a few resumes or applications. That's nice, but you are one of hundreds or thousands of people. That is not what Joanne Chang did. What she did instead, which made all the difference, is that she started from an entirely different direction. She started at the top with a vision of what she wanted. She made a list of the dozen chefs in her city that she respected the most. And she wrote them each a personal letter. And she explained who she was and said, hey, I don't have any formal training, but I'm willing to learn and I'm willing to work hard. And she reached out and explained exactly why she wanted to work with them. The very next day, it turned out, Lydia Shire, who was one of the top chefs in her city, one of the top chefs in the country, got Joanne's letter. And that day, her prep cook quit. So she said, you know what? Let's give this woman a chance. 
So she brought her in for the next eight years. Joanne apprenticed with her, learned everything she knew. Joanne went on to open her own bakery, which was a smash hit. Today, she owns three bakeries and a restaurant and has written multiple cookbooks. Today, she is considered one of the best chefs in her city, if not the country. But that started, that began by asking for what she wanted. She didn't look at what was already out there, what was being advertised, and said, oh, maybe I'll try that. That is how you play the same game as everyone else. That is how you end up settling for crumbs. Instead, you need to formulate that picture, that vision of what you want and seek it out. And that's exactly what she did. Now, I want to tell you about a study. And this is a study about podcasting. But actually, it's really a study about life. There's a researcher named Josh Morgan. He did a study, a longitudinal study of podcasts from June 2005 to June 2015. Now, the first thing that he discovered, as you can probably imagine, there are a lot of podcasts. In fact, when he did this study, there were 206,000 podcasts. Today, there are even more. A lot of people would look at that and say, oh my gosh, that's enormous. Why should I bother starting one? How can I even compete with that? How can you hope to be heard in a world where there's 200,000 people clamoring? It turns out that's the wrong question. Because what Josh Morgan discovered in his study, looking at this 10-year period, is that the average podcast lasted only 12 episodes before its creator shut it down and stopped doing it. And in fact, in that moment when he looked at the podcasts in June of 2015, he looked at these 206,000 podcasts. At that moment, only 40% of those podcasts were even active. And he had the world's most liberal definition of active. That meant that they had released one episode in the preceding six months. People look at the competition so often and they say, I can't do that. I can't compete. There's too many people out there. They think they're competing against 200,000 people. So much more often, you're actually competing against 2,000 people, maybe even 200 people. Because if you are good and you persevere, you are going to outlast almost everyone. You are going to be able to keep going and through sheer force of will, make your way to success. Now the challenge, of course, is being able to persist. And that is why it's so important to focus on the small wins. This is a woman named Stephanie O'Connell. Like a lot of young people with a big dream, Stephanie moved to New York City in hopes of becoming a Broadway actress. Now, she discovered pretty fast that New York is an expensive place. And so if she was gonna last, if she was gonna be able to persevere in the city, she needed to get a handle on her finances. So she started a blog. She called it The Broke and Beautiful Life. And pretty soon, it actually started to get some traction. She realized maybe this could be something. But what Stephanie did is important because we all know you don't go overnight from just starting out to being on national television. It takes a while. And Stephanie learned to savor the small wins. She remembers the first time that an influencer that she respected retweeted one of her posts because that showed that she was on the right track. She remembers the first time that instead of having to blog for free again and again and again, that someone actually paid her $25 for a post. Now, $25 is not a lot of money, but she told me, that's two hours that I don't have to be a waitress. That's someone saying, your work has value. 
If we can remember that, if we can remember those small wins, it will keep us going on the path to success. Finally, we have to rethink what's possible and what's impossible. This is John Lee Dumas. John was a US Army veteran, and when he came back after the service, he tried a lot of things. He got jobs in, in finance and startups and real estate. None of it stuck. But when he was working in real estate, one thing he did a lot of was drive around town in his car. And while he was driving around, he discovered something he actually did love, podcasts. But back when this was happening, 2011, 2012, there was one thing that everybody knew about podcasts, and that was you cannot make money with podcasting. It's a nice hobby, it's fun to do, but it's not a way to make a living. But what John discovered is that sometimes if you flip just a couple of key assumptions, you can change everything. Now, at the time, podcasts were much less popular than they are now. There's only so many people listening. Most podcasters, of course, because they had day jobs, were only releasing an episode once a week, so four times a month. If you were going to make money from sponsorship income, a company was only interested in doing that if you had a really large audience, if you had a lot of monthly downloads. John realized something. You're only gonna get so many monthly downloads if you have four episodes a month. But if instead of releasing an episode once a week, you do it once per day, you can immediately 7X your revenue. Instead of four episodes a month, you have 30. Within a few short months, John was able to amass a number of monthly downloads that was big enough that sponsors were interested. They started giving him money. Other podcasters started taking note. They said, what's this guy doing? What's his secret? And so he began creating a paid online community of other podcasters and became a leader in the field. His momentum has grown so much and his podcast was ultimately named a best of iTunes that today he actually manages to bring in $500,000 per month from his podcast. He's become one of the most successful podcasters ever. When you rethink what's possible and what's impossible, you can change everything. That's how we make ourselves future-proof. We live in a world of disruption and every day it's only becoming more so. Over the past few years, I have consciously and deliberately worked to cultivate multiple income streams in my business. I now have seven. And through that process, it's done a lot of things. It's brought in more revenue for me. It's mitigated my risk. It's introduced me to, to new people and new experiences. It's helped me develop new skills. And it's my hope for you whether you work for yourself or if you have a day job that you love and want to keep, that if you cultivate a portfolio career, that that can do the same for you. Thank you.